Right. Good morning. If you would uh, open your copy of God's Word to the book of Psalm 96. And uh, <clears throat> if you're visiting with us this morning and you don't have a Bible or if you don't have a smartphone and you'd like to follow along, we have some Bibles on the back bookshelf. You can uh, grab one of those and follow along with us. And if you don't own a Bible, um, you're welcome to keep it. Um, Psalm chapter 96, uh, title of the sermon this morning is Contagious Worship. So let's read the text, and I'll open us in a word of prayer, and then we'll uh, jump into the sermon this morning. Psalm 96, beginning in verse 1. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless His name. Tell of His salvation from day to day. Declare His glory among the nations, His marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the people are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble tremble before him, all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. If you'll pray alongside me. God, we pray now as we dive into your word, Lord, and, and, and worship, God, that you would convict us, God, uh, that this is worship, Lord, as we, uh, not just in the singing though that is worship as well, not just um, what we do during the praise time, God, or or any other time, Lord, but that our whole life is worship as we listen, as we read your word, as we give, as we go out and have dinner or lunch, whatever we do, God, would you convict us that this is worship and that um, our lives are an offering unto you. I pray, God, that you would make our lives contagious to those around us, that they would see and want what you have so graciously given us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. How do we fight against not letting ourselves become bored and worship? Not just in singing, but in prayer, reading our Bible, giving, small group, listening to teaching and preaching outreach, discipleship. How do we fight against not letting ourselves grow bored in that? Paul Tripp, in uh, quoting someone else, I don't remember who, uh, but at the conference said, be, uh, just stuck out to me. He said, be careful not to stand next to the mercy seat and be bored. One of the reasons that we want to fight against growing bored in worship is that God designed our worship to be evangelistic, to be contagious. Paul writes to the Corinthians, but if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an outsider enters our worship setting, he is convicted by all, he is called to account by all, the secrets of his heart are disclosed, and so falling on his face He will worship God and declare that God is really among you. When have you ever seen that happen? (laughs) Because, man, I want to see that. And Paul says that, that, that this can happen. How do we have contagious worship? The kind that when people see it and they hear it, and they feel it, and they uh, experience it, they want it. Not just the worship, 
Not just the worship experience, but they want the object of that worship. They want it. This is why the Psalms are so important to the Christian life. They are. Because they stretch us, don't they? Don't the Psalms stretch us? They stretch us in ways that we otherwise wouldn't be stretched. Most of us don't wake up in the morning excited to stretch. I don't know about you. I, I, I certainly don't. The only time I've ever stretched in my life is when I was at basketball practice and our coach would bark at us, you know, to uh, hold that stretch 10 more seconds, a little longer. You see, the Psalms serve as that coach and they come and meet us in our uh, tight lactic acid state. And they help us to stretch ourselves in ways that are uncomfortable. But glorifying to God and beneficial to our souls. Our goal in anything that we do as a church this morning, small group, Friday night, hangouts, prayer gatherings, meals. Our goal in anything that we do as a church is twofold. Number one, to bring glory to God Almighty by displaying that glory. To display the glory of God in whatever we do, wherever we go. And number two, in displaying that glory, that others would catch it. They'd catch it. It's kind of like the opposite of a sneeze or a cough. You know, when you sneeze or cough, you, you kind of, you want to shield people, or you should shield people from it, especially if you're sick here this morning. Please shield us. Uh, you want to shield them from that, so you sneeze, in, not in your hands, in your sleeve or inside your shirt, and you do that so others won't catch it. This is the opposite. In our worship, we want it to be contagious. We want you to catch it. We want others to get infected with what God has so graciously infected us with. How do we do that? The Psalms are a great blueprint for contagious worship. This morning I have four sections, and uh, I'm going to give it to you some alliteration because Southern Baptist pastors like to alliterate. I don't know why. Uh, amen. I don't know why. Uh, here are the four sections. The importance of worship, the imperatives of worship, the indicatives of worship, the invitations of worship. The importance of worship, the imperatives of worship, the, the commands. What are we commanded to do? The indicatives of worship, the reality. What has God already done? Who is God? Who God, who God is? And then the invitations of worship. What are we invited into? So that's the four sections. And let me clarify as well, though. These are not neatly compacted categories, all right? They overlap. All imperatives are invitations. They are. And all of them stress the importance of worship. So they overlap. They're not meant to be necessarily neat categories. I've just divided them up grammatically for my mental thinking state and for yours, all right? Here we go. The importance of worship. Before we look at the text of Psalm 96, I want to give the context. It's always important whenever you look at any text to look at the context. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the context of this is, is uh, 1 Chronicles 16, 23 to 33. Psalm 96 is actually reproduced in 1 Chronicles 16, 23 to 33. They're not exact duplicates, but they're pretty close. And so what I want to do is I want to spend a few minutes giving the context of 1 Chronicles 16. Now, you can turn there if you want. I would encourage you not to because I think you'll stop listening to me and start reading the text. And not that that would be bad, but uh, you can read the text anytime. Um, all right. Uh, so here's what I want to do. I want to go through this really quickly and stay with me here, please, because I'm, I'm going to bring this home, Okay. I'm going to bring it home and I'm going to make a point, but, but stay with me because it's going to be a lot. All right, here we go. The Philistines had captured the ark during Saul's reign. And so the Philistine is at the camp. Now they get it back, but it stays at Abinadad's house. And after God removed Saul and anointed King David, David says to his people, 
Let us again go bring the ark of God back to us, for we did not seek it in the days of Saul. We didn't seek it. So they go to Abinadad's house where the ark is. They put it on a cart and they begin moving it. But that's not how they're supposed to be moving it. It's not supposed to be on a cart. It's supposed to be carried with poles. So one of the animals stumbles. And as it stumbles, Uzzah reaches out to grab it and God kills him for it. Now David is terrified. He's terrified because he's like, who can handle this thing? So it stays in Obed-Edom's house for three months. David fights the Philistines. He defeats the Philistines. David builds houses for himself in the city of David. He prepares a, a, a place for the ark of God. He pitches a tent for it. David assembled all of Israel at Jerusalem for this purpose. He gets together everybody in the kingdom for this purpose and this purpose alone, to bring the ark of the Lord to its place that he had prepared for it. David gets the priests and the Levites together and he says, hey, Levites, you are to carry the ark. It was because of you, well, not because of you, it was because you, the Levites, did not bring it up the first time that the Lord your God broke out in anger against us. We did not inquire of him about how it was to be brought in the prescribed way. You see, God had prescribed to them. He said, carry this on poles. Don't put it on a cart. And, and don't let anybody carry this. Only the Levites may carry this. If we were ever to think that God didn't care about details, this is a passage that teaches us. Uzzah is a constant reminder that God cares about details. David also commanded the chief of the Levites to appoint their brothers as a singer who should play loudly on musical instruments, on harps and lyres and cymbals, to raise sounds of joy. And while they bring the ark back, David appointed gatekeeper, gatekeepers, musicians, singers, doorkeepers. And every six steps that they took, David sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. Man, that's a lot of animals. So all Israel brought up the ark of the covenant of the Lord with shouting to the sound of horn, trumpets, cymbals, and they made loud music on harps and lyres. Loud music on harps? How do you, how do you, how do, you do that? They bring the ark inside the tent and they presented burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. David appointed some of the Levites as ministers before the ark of the Lord to invoke, to thank, to praise the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. That day, when the ark comes into the tent, David first committed Asaph and his associates this psalm of thanks to the Lord. And 1 Chronicles 16, 8 to 22 is Psalm 105. 1 Chronicles 16, 23 to 33 is Psalm 96, and 1 Chronicles 16, 35 to 36 is Psalm 106. All three Psalms are kind of blended together and woven together, and that's what they sing and praise God with. After finishing the Psalm, after all three of those are sung and praising God, David left Asaph and his brothers there before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to minister regularly before the Ark as each day required. He left Zadok, the priest, and his brothers, the priest, to offer burnt offerings to the Lord on the altar of the burnt offering, morning and evening, every day in Israel, morning and evening, a burnt offering to the Lord. With them were Haman, or Heman, and Jaduthun, and the rest of those chosen and expressly named to give thanks to the Lord. Now here's what I'm getting at. Why so much detail? I mean, if we read in your own time, if you go back and read 1 Chronicles 15 and 16, the question that I'm lingered with is this, why so much detail? David gets everybody together. The roles are assigned for the priest. 
Roles are assigned for the Levites. How we carry the ark is important. He creates ministry jobs for gatekeepers, musicians, singers, doorkeepers. Every six steps, they're making sacrifices. Roles are assigned down to the very instrument. You play the cymbal. You play the lyre. You play the harp. You play the trumpet. You play the horn. I want you to play loud. I want you to play with rejoicing. Levites, you have a job to do. Singers, you have a job to do. Musicians, you have a job to do. Priest, you're to offer sacrifices. Haman and Jaduthin, you guys are simply to give thanks. He actually appointed people to just stand there and say, give thanks to the Lord. Over and over again. Jaduthin, your sons are to do it. No, 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 not Jaduthin. Your sons are to do it at the gate. Okay, go to the gate. Why so much detail? Because worship is the most important thing that we do on this earth. Worship is the most important thing that we do on this earth. And if, if there's any pushback in your mind, I thought evangelism was the most important thing that we do on this earth. We go and evangelize that they might worship. And evangelism is worship. Worship is the most important thing that we do on this earth. Now, granted, you might, if you're sitting there thinking, well, well, duh, Matt, of course. I think when we read the Bible, we might be guilty of thinking that the really good stuff happened in the stories. You know, like the walls of Jericho. Man, that was a cool story. You know, or David and Goliath. That was a cool story. The Exodus, Elijah calling down fire from heaven. Daniel in the lion's den. Don't get me wrong, those are all majestic stories. They are, I love them. But we must not make the mistake of thinking that was the good stuff. And the singing, the sacrifices, the doorkeeping, the changing out of bread, that was just simply mundane, religious, ritualistic tasks. To be fair, it could become that. It absolutely, and often it did become that. But that's certainly not David's heart, and most certainly is not God's heart, and it's not our heart either. Brothers and sisters, hear me, friends and guests, hear me when I say this, guys. The great moments of your life is not when you graduated high school or college or you got a, your first job, or you got your dream job, or you got a promotion, or you got married, you had a baby, you won a championship, you got to go on a dream vacation, you retired at 50, or even ministry. Those are great moments. But none of them surpass the greatness of worshiping God. I want to challenge us not to think that these are the great moments of my life and that worshiping God is just something else. Guys, the great moments of your life is when you sit down tomorrow morning at 7 a.m., half asleep, cup of tea, a warm blanket, or a cup of coffee, your Bible, your pen, your knees, and your God. Those are the great moments of your life. Now don't take that to say that like, I'm pitting that against like, well, what about when I go out and share the gospel? Like, no, like, I'm not, it's both, okay? I'm not saying that that's more important. It's not. I'm just saying like, be careful not to think that those individual moments where you meet with God and you worship God in prayer and in the word 
and in listening. That's, that's, that's the good stuff. That's the good stuff. Contagious worship is worship that lives as though it is the most important thing that we do in our lives. The imperative, second section, the imperatives of worship. The psalmist gives 14 imperatives in Psalm 96. 14. We won't look at all 14 because some, most of, some, a lot of them are repeated. First to sing. Three times. The psalmist says, sing. Look at verse 1a. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Verse 1b, sing. Verse 2a, sing. Contagious worship is the kind of worship that doesn't get stuck and wrote routine worship that's why he says sing to the lord not a song a new song just as in a marriage or in a relationship or even in a friendship you got to change things up you don't want to do the same thing all the time you got to change it up that's what romance is that's even in a friendship you can be romantic in a friendship change it up sing to the lord a new song Sing the Lord a loud song. Pray a new method. You ever thought about that? You ever, has prayer ever become bored for you? Man, it's the same. Oh, I don't even like, pray a new method. You don't know a method? Come talk to me. I'll give you 37. Pray a new method. If prayer has become bored for you. Ten times the psalmist tells his congregants, sing. Ten times. Bless. Verse 2a, bless his name, or in other words, praise his name. Listen, we're, we are to bless the name of the Lord, not just uh, in the prayer closet, but also the work cubicle, not just at 925 South King Street, but also 615 South King Street, King Noodle House. <laughs> tell, verse 2b, tell of his salvation from day to day. Worship is not just singing. It's also telling. The word tell means to bring good news or announce good news. New King James says, proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Listen, the world is filled with bad news. It is. They need people who have good news even if they don't receive it that way. And often they will not receive your good news as good. But still, tell it to them. Tell. Declare, verse 3a, declare His glory among the nations. Missions is worship. As John Piper famously said, missions exist because worship doesn't. That's why we go on missions. Because we want to see the nations worship God. If that's not your motivation to go on worship, it's the, you're motivated by something incomplete. You go on missions because you want to see the nations worship God because he's worthy of it. A scribe, look at verse uh, uh, 7a, 7b, and, and 8a, three times. Just like sing in the first two verses, that's repeated three times. A scribe is mentioned three times. Well, how do we ascribe? What does it mean to ascribe? We don't use that word, right? When's the last time that we use that, that term? Well, in common street language, the phrase we would use is, you better recognize. <laughs> that's the idea. Acknowledge recognize the glory, the strength of God, the glory do his name. It's interesting the New Living Testament translates it as, O oh, nations of the world, recognize the Lord. Recognize that the Lord is glorious and strong. Back in the 70s and 80s, maybe even to the 90s, people would go to the Saints game. And then Saints is a, a football team in New Orleans, if you, if you don't know anything about football. Um, football team in New Orleans called the Saints. People would go to the games and they'd put brown paper bags over their heads. They were called the Aints because they were so bad. And people would go to the Packers game in Green Bay and they would take their shirt off in sub-zero temperature 
So one was putting garments on because they were so ashamed to be there. And one was taking garments off because they were so proud to be there. So delighted to be there. Guys, we want to worship in such a way. Not with your shirts off. (laughs) I know you thought I was going there. We want to worship in such a way that people recognize our recognition. That they see us ascribing glory and strength to God. And they want to be a part of it. Bring, look at verse 8b, bring an offering. Worship that is contagious is worship that is sacrificial. The greatest thing about an offering is that it's not required. I mean, if you work out at a gym, well, uh, you, you, you have to pay your membership due. There's nothing glorious about showing up at a gym, in and of it, like just showing up. Because you paid to be there. There's, there's no praise, no glory in just showing up at the gym. You paid, you showed up. And if you want to worship God, you can just show up. You can. But like David, who won't sacrifice to the Lord something that cost him nothing, we too bring an offering because we love God. We bring an offering because we love Him. That is contagious. That is contagious worship. Come, look at verse 8b. Come into his courts. The psalmist previously writes, My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. There is something so contagious. I don't know about you, but there's something so contagious about being around somebody that you know when they are at this place or doing this activity, there's nothing else they'd rather be doing. I mean, it could be like, badminton and I I don't know a thing about badminton but if I'm around you and I know that like this is your favorite thing to do in the entire world and you're playing with all your might I want to go play I want to join you because it's contagious I might even choose that over basketball the same with Worship. Worship, 9a. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Worship the Lord in splendor of holiness or or the beauty of holiness. Perhaps this is an objective definition of beauty. I know we often say that there is no objective definition of beauty. Perhaps this is it. The holiness of God. What What is beauty defined? The holiness of God. As Christians, we should be lovers of beauty. We should, because all beauty stems from him. So we should be promoting beauty in our workplaces, in art, and in, in thinking, and writing, and in what, whatever it is. Worship the Lord and the beauty of his holiness. Tremble. Tremble before him all the earth. Verse 9b. Seems odd to command the people to tremble, right? It's either natural or it's not. You, how, can, you, can you command somebody? I mean, you could physically tremble, but is that really trembling? How can you command people to tremble? I asked myself when I read this, when was the last time, Matt, you trembled before God? I'd encourage you to ask yourself that same question, maybe this week sometime. When was the last time that you actually went down to pray or were in worship or were reading the Bible or whatever and you trembled before God? When was the last time that happened? I, 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 I had to be honest, I was like, God, I don't know that I've ever done that. I don't know that I've ever, like, trembled I've trembled like watching sports. It's like fourth down, fourth quarter, Super Bowl, three seconds left, last play of the game. And I'm like, (sighs) I don't know that I've ever done that with God. This is why I said earlier, the Psalms stretch us, don't they? Don't they stretch us? It's probably not natural for us to tremble. We're more inclined to yawn than tremble. Psalms stretch us. Say, verse 10a, say among the nations. Once again, we see that God's heart was for the nations, even in the Old Testament. 
God specifically chose Israel, but he chose Israel that Israel's worship, what? Would spread. God said, I chose you, Israel, but it wasn't like, God, uh, Israel, I want you to go and, and just enjoy your prize in the corner. No, he says, take your prize and go spread it. Say among the nations, go and tell among the nations that the Lord reigns. Contagious worship is worship that takes up the imperative, the impetus to spread the glory of God. Third category, the indicatives of worship. What, what has God done? Worship is never just about what we need to do. As though God depended on our worship. But worship is primarily about what God has done and who God is. And we are depending on that. We are responding to him and who he is and what he has done. So yes, we're given 14 imperatives in this psalm, but that's not really the focus of the psalm. The focus is, look at God. Look at our God. Look at who he is. Look at what he's done. Marvelous works, number one, marvelous works. Look at verse 3b. Declare his glory among the nations. His marvelous works among all the peoples. There's Hebrew parallelism going on here, which means that the second verse kind of expounds the second part of the verse expounds the first part of the verse or explains the first part of the verse. So that tells us that his glory in 3a, declare his glory, is in part his marvelous works in 3b. Why is that important? I, I think it's important because I think sometimes when we're worshiping, we kind of feel like we're worshiping an abstract concept, don't we? It's like, you ever think about that? Like God, God just feels abstract. I don't really know how, how do I picture him is he an old man is he a fire I don't really know how to think of him in my mind or even when we're sharing the gospel this is the trouble when we go out and share the gospel we tell people about God we kind of sometimes share about God as though he was an abstract concept one of the ways that we can get around that it's only one of the ways one of the ways that we can get around that is to talk about the wondrous and marvelous works of God. To tell people about what he has done. We recently switched uh, to Costco from Sam's because we were forced to. Um, and imagine if you're trying to tell somebody why Costco was better than Sam's. You know, you would tell them things like they have better customer service. They absolutely do. They have a better return policy. Better products, more expensive products, better products, more free samples, more nutritious food, better food court. They do have a better food court. And this is what you would do, right? You would tell them all of these things as to why Costco is better than Sam's. It's the same idea with God. When we talk about God, tell them about who God is and what he has done. Tell them, look, our God doesn't require us to earn salvation. He earned it for us in the cross of Jesus Christ. Your God says you must do this and do this, and you've got to keep doing that to earn it. Our God tells us, no, he earned it for us. Our God won't stop loving his children. You, you live under this fear that, that if you anger him, that he's going to be angry with you and do this to you. Our God doesn't work that way. Our God loves us. He patiently endured the Israelites for thousands of years. Our God fights for us. We have to think that like we're, we're you know, we had to fight the battles. And it's like, no, our God actually fights for us. Just as he fought for Moses and the Israelites. Now listen, don't misunderstand me. I am not, let me clarify, I am not saying go do a marketing pitch for God. God doesn't need our marketing pitch. But if we want someone to switch from Sam's to Costco, tell them about the, who they are. And if you want somebody to worship God, tell them about the marvelous things that God has done. Tell them. It's okay. I know you, you, if you tell them, like, yeah, he rose from the dead, that sounds crazy. Tell them. 
Because he did it. Great is the Lord. Look at verse 4a. For great is the Lord. And greatly to be praised. He is great. It's such a simple phrase, but it carries so much power. I mean, we sing that, how great is our God, great is the Lord, you know, and, and sometimes that phrase kind of loses its force, like our God is great, you know. But listen, th those words have power. Let me, let, me, let me show it to you, all right? Your friend says, hey, I'm thinking about going to Greece. I've never been. I know you've been. What do you think? Oh, it was great. There's power in those words. Hey, I can't decide between ABC restaurant and XYZ restaurant. I know you've been to ABC. What do you think? Oh man, the food is great. It's great. There's power in those words. And the same with God. Our God is great. Man, he is so great. There's power in those words. How many testimonies have I heard, and I'm sure that you have heard before, where somebody came to you and said, I mean, I just want to be something, I want to be part of something bigger than myself. Like, if, if, like if, if all this life is, is about the greatness of self, like if that's it, like just about my own greatness, like, man, that's unsatisfying. That's so unsatisfying if, if, if that's all that life is, is about the greatness of Matt. I want to be part of something. Friends, the world is looking for something great. They are. They don't, even if they don't know it, they're looking for something great. Point them to our great God. Point them to how great God is. He made the heavens. Look at verse 5b. But the Lord made the heavens. Which is to say, he made everything another way. So that when we see the tiny ant carrying a crumb that weighs 50 times its weight, which is just amazing to me. It's like me carrying a thousand pounds. And we marvel, we marvel at the God who made this ant. Or when you go hiking and you get to the top, you know, like you've worked for this. You get to the top and you sit down and you look out at this view and the colors and the sounds and the solitude and it's just serene and you're just like you marvel at the God who made all of that he made the heavens splendor majesty strength and beauty look at verse 6 splendor and majesty are before him strength and beauty are in his sanctuary God has never had a bad hair day he's never had a bad attitude he never wakes up on the wrong side of the bed. He's never crabby. He's never moody. Ever. He is always perfectly splendid, majestic, beautiful. Even as he hung upon a cross with his flesh ripped wide open, gushing out blood, splendor and majesty were before him. Strength and beauty we're in the sanctuary of the body of Jesus Christ. The Lord reigns. Look at verse 10a. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. There are few things that speak louder than a person who can remain peaceful and still in tumultuous times. Isn't there? The world's falling apart and somebody, like, it's like Jesus on the boat, you know. <laughs> he's, he's just sleeping. How can you sleep? You see, the world walks around in anxiety. We see it, don't we? And to be fair, maybe we walk around in anxiety, but the world walks around in anxiety. You could just go to the workplace, go to any workplace, and you'll see people walking around just anxious. Stock market, housing crisis. Did you guys hear, uh, this isn't in the sermon, that uh, some uh, cryptocurrency got like hacked of like $30 billion. Did you guys hear about that? And I was like, man, if I was the founder, I'd be like, oh my God, <laughs> I need to become a hacker. Uh, like the, the housing crisis in Seattle, it's like every day, it's like the home prices keep going up. 
new laws being made, gun violence. I just heard yesterday or this morning that five people were killed in somewhere. I don't know if you guys heard about that. The uncertainty of the future. Jobs, like am I going to get a job? Am I going to be able to keep a job? The world walks around with all this anxiety. And while I'm not advocating being an ostrich with our spiritual head in the sand, I am advocating that we lay our head to bed at rest at night. And we maintain our joy and our peace among our friends and our family. Why? Because the Lord reigns. The Lord reigns. We make a powerful statement to the world. You make a powerful statement to your family and to your friends and to your co-worker when they see you and they say, how can you be at such peace? How do you do it? Because the Lord reigns. The world is established. It shall never be moved. Verse 10b. Again, the psalmist is affirming that God is in control. Guys, if the world is established and it won't be moved, how much more is God's plans and purposes for your life established and it won't be moved? Guys, God's plans and purposes for your life is already established. Even your mistakes, he's already like algorithmed it into the the planning. And it won't be moved. It's established. He will judge with fairness, righteousness, and faithfulness. Look at verse 10c. He will judge them with equity. Verse 13, he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness, the peoples and his faithfulness. We worship a God who will make all things right. He will correct every incorrection. He will right every wrong. He will bring justice to every injustice. He will. This is why men like Job and David and Paul and Jesus were able to worship God in the worst of conditions. They were able to worship God in the worst of injustices. Why? Because they trust that God is acting righteously and faithfully, and he will act righteously and faithfully. Contagious worship is worship that lives in light of what God has already accomplished. Living in light of that. The last one, the invitations of worship. Worship is the greatest invitation. It is. It's not like getting invited to the Oscars or the Super Bowl or dinner with a celebrity. Those would be great, but they don't meet our greatest need. Worship does that. Worship is an invitation to have our greatest need met, which is worship itself. Our greatest need is worship. God is greatly to be praised. Verse 4a. uh, For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Not only is God great, he is greatly to be praised. Or in other words, the greatness of our praise is to match the greatness of our God. Certainly, even on our best day, our praise falls immeasurably short of the greatness of God. So we're not saying that like our praise could ever match the greatness of God. But this is an invitation to bring our best we, we are not coming to worship with our blind and lame animals. We come with our best. We come with hearts open, minds awake, mouth singing, voices declaring, pocketbooks giving, hands serving, kneels, knees kneeling, all because, not because you have to, but because God is greatly to be praised. He is to be feared. Verse 4b, he's to be revered, honored. Proverbs tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. You ever been in that place? I'm in this place all the time. So I'm assuming you are at least some of the time, if not all the time. Like, I just wish I knew the right thing to do. I wish I knew how to make good decisions. 
I wish I knew the answers to these questions. Like, I don't, I don't know what to do. I don't know who to date. I don't know what home to buy. I don't know where to go to school. I don't know if I should go back to school and get my master's. I don't know what to do. What's the answer to that? Is there an answer to that? God invites you to get wisdom, to get knowledge. How? Through the fear of the Lord. That's why when, when we hear, oh, fear God, it's not like, oh, gosh. No, it's like, oh, yes. May I fear him that I would get wisdom and knowledge. And then lastly, five examples of personification. Let the heavens be glad, verse 11a. Let the earth rejoice, verse 11a. Let the sea roar, verse 11b. Let the field exalt, verse 12a. Let the trees of the forest sing for joy, verse 12b. God has made everything in his creation contagious for worship. God designed the world in such a way that the heavens declare the glory of God. He designed it in such a way that his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that are made. Every day the sun wakes up and burns with worship for God. Every day the waves crash upon the shore, declaring praise to their maker. Every day the trees grow higher and stronger, reaching out to praise their maker. And every day at 5 a.m., the birds outside my window sing <laughs> praise to God. And this majestic ensemble is going on around us every day. And God invites us to step up onto the choir platform and to join the chorus. Not just in singing, but with our lives. Our worship will either be innocuous or contagious. Or another way to put it, our lives, your life, will either be innocuous or contagious. It will be one or the other. Let's live in such a way that our worship of God is contagious to those around us.